Uh, I do want to tackle a few questions that always get asked on every panel or, or thread or video that I am involved in. And I want to go ahead and tackle those just so we can open up the floor to some awesome new questions. <laughs> now, the first question, does it sound like I'm tired of answering those questions? <laughs> no, it's totally cool. I, I love these same questions. It's just that I, I think there's so many new ones that I love just opening it up for, for that potential by just giving a preemptive answer to these. Um, the first one I always get asked is, how do you upload videos to YouTube or respond to comments or things like that? I'll, I'll comment on a video in one of my own videos on my channel and people will accuse me of not really being blind because how did you respond to that comment if you're blind? How do you, and I, I, I try to point out to them that blindness and illiteracy are actually two different things. But I, I don't think that's what they meant, but that's what I answered. Like, how did you write this? I'm like, dude, I, I can move my hands. They, they still work. It's my eye. I'm not hand blind. But the question that they're asking is how do you interact with visual technology is what they're really asking in perhaps a less articulate way. Um, the answer to that is there are so many different devices that can be used for that. Um, chief among them, I use my iPhone with a screen reader program that's built into all Apple products from iPods to Apple TVs, all that stuff, um, called the VoiceOver. And it allows me, it is different from Siri, which a lot of people conflate it with, but it basically allows me to hear anything that's on the screen. And instead of tapping on buttons to activate things, it allows me to swipe around on the screen with various gestures. Um, so instead of maybe just poking a button on the screen, I'll swipe my finger like so until voiceover's cursor moves to the item that I want, at which point it will read it aloud and I will tap twice quickly. That allows me to activate items on screen. And the reason you do a quick double tap is because if they had to do a single tap, then any time I touched on the screen looking for something, it would just open that item. So it's little features like, uh, like this, like voiceover, and it's double tap gestures and things like that that allow me to read what people post on my YouTube channel and allow me to upload and even edit my own videos. I do all of my own video editing um, and I have a lot of luck with it. Now, um, as far as replying to comments on things, I often use the iPhone as well. Uh, I use a mode called Braille Screen Input where you actually do a special gesture and then rotate your phone into a different position and you can actually type with all six fingers on the screen making the Braille characters. Um, I say six fingers instead of ten because there are only six braille dots, but you use those and you type braille characters on the screen and it turns them into print. So I can absolutely write like that. I also have a braille computer. It's called a braille note touch and it is a computer that has pins in a little display, a little network of cells that raise and lower to create braille characters and it's absolutely cool and I can use that to read and write online as well. So rather than not really being blind, the actual answer to that question is there's a lot more accessible technology than people are aware of. So that's, that's one of my biggest questions that I get is how do you actually interact with your viewers? Um, another big question that I get is how do you play, you know, how do you play these games? How do you actually succeed at doing that? And I've covered that extensively here with discussions of accessibility and sound. But people seem to always wonder, how, how do you still do what you do? And it's, it's really all in the listening. It's all in the stereo sound. That is the key component, is stereo sound. If you can hear it, then you can do it. If you can hear where it is, you can do it. It's sort of like having um, bifocal vision, knowing that you can judge the depth of something based on having both eyes looking at it and seeing how far it is. If you can compare sound within one ear and the other ear, and those pitches are different or those levels are different, you can then tell where something is on a screen or relative to you. To uh, illustrate this, I did a video recently playing Soul Calibur VI with my back to the screen, and just for good measure, so people could be sure I wasn't secretly not blind and looking at a mirror off screen, because people have asked that, believe me, people think I'm a lot smarter than I am. I never would have even thought of putting a mirror off screen and being sighted. To, to do that video, but just to make sure, I wore a blindfold also. Uh, apparently it was right after the movie Bird Box came out, so a lot of people thought I was doing something <laughs> uh, That was a thing, I had to watch that movie to figure out what the world they were talking about. I'm like, there are, no, there are no birds here, what are you talking about? Now I know I know what it is. So it wasn't that as it happens, but it showed that 
sound is how I do what I do. If you're interested in that video, it's totally up on my channel, and I have uh, business cards with my YouTube channel link on it that I can give to anyone interested because there's a lot of ridiculous crap on my YouTube channel. Um, anyway, I do want to go ahead, those are two of the biggest questions I get. I, I do want to go ahead and open up the floor for questions. If anyone wants to just ask away any, anything you want, I will do my absolute best to answer it. Hello. So just to make sure I understand your question correctly, you're asking, as far as getting in touch with developers, giving them feedback on games and such, how exactly does that happen? Yeah, how did you get in touch with them? How did you get this channel of feedback open? Fantastic question, and it, it, yeah, that really is a great question. Um, sometimes it's just a fluke, to be honest with you, it really depends on the developer. Um, for Soul Calibur, for instance, um, when playing the latest Soul Calibur game was very popular on Twitter. Uh, people putting, you know, hashtags and such for showing off their Soul Calibur matches. And I actually had some viewers on YouTube um, send some of my matches to uh, Okubo, the creator of Soul Calibur, who ended up watching them and retweeting the videos. And that opened a channel of communication about stereo sound and the importance thereof. Um, when it came to another very, very awesome game that I have neglected to mention so far called Fantasy Strike, that one was one of my absolute favorite channels of communication because I found this game online. It was a very, very cool fighting game made by uh, David Serlin, and I loved the look of it, but it wasn't out yet, so I hadn't been able to, of course, play it or test it or anything like that. So I posted on their YouTube channel, and that's honestly how I get a lot of uh, connections with people is just reaching out, posting on social media and things like that, tagging people or commenting on threads, and just making it clear that I'm blind and I'm interested in what you're doing. And that seems to get people's notice. And it certainly got the notice of the people at Fantasy Strike because I posted something to the effect of, hi, I'm a blind gamer and I am really interested in this game. It sounds amazing, but I really hope that it does have pan stereo sound and other features that will help blind people like myself get to enjoy your awesome game, because trust me, we will give you our money if this game is accessible. They loved that, apparently, because the next day I ended up with an email from their lead sound designer, Bobby Moen, who happens to also live in Austin, who invited me over to his house where he does all his sound work to come work on the game. Now, after looking him up online to make sure I wasn't just getting invited to a strange man's house on the internet, <laughs> as wonderful as that sounds, I, <laughs> I decided to, uh, you know, go and check it out. So Kelsey and I went over to his house, and sure enough, he was actually the lead sound designer of Fantasy Strike. And we talked for a long time about, we just sat down and we talked, and he took notes about what makes games accessible from a sound perspective for blind people. Then we went upstairs and we actually played the game. He had it set up in his sound uh, studio with huge monitors, and we just sat there and we played for a couple of hours, just back and forth. He and I played, and he let Kelsey and I play so we could see how the two of us would interact with the game. And we just made notes about everything, about, you know, these sounds are amazing. The fact that I can hear them going left and right is awesome, but hey, this character has a super meter that fills up and it makes no sound, so I have no idea when I can use his attack again. Or I can't hear the characters at all because they have no footsteps. So when they jump, I can hear that, but if they're just walking, I have no idea when they're moving or where they are on screen. Um, but other sounds in this game are amazing. Then about two months later, for the early release of the game, for those who had bought it early, a patch came out that included a sound effect for the super meter so that people would know when it was full and footsteps unique for every character with different sounds for when they move backward and forward and with unique sounds for each footfall so that you know if the character moving is the giant stone golem or the almost barefoot ninja walking around. Every sound was completely different and it was absolutely phenomenal. So channels of feedback are opened by reaching out and not being afraid to post comments everywhere and let everyone know that, hey, I'm blind and I'm interested in this. A big factor for me was actually also the website Reddit, which my fiance got me into because she loves Reddit. 
Um, and I started posting on their subreddits, r slash gaming, r slash Mortal Kombat, r slash Street Fighter, basically any fighting game you can think of with the word r slash in front of it. I posted on those subreddits. And that got me a lot of positive feedback, not just on, from random Redditors, but that's how I ended up getting contacted by uh, Vice News on HBO, who ended up flying out to Austin to do a story on me uh, for HBO. And they spent a, like a day and a half filming me and Kelsey playing video games, which was awesome because then I got to take time off work to play video games. But um, it was all about communication, about not being afraid to put yourself out there, about being friendly in your approach to doing so. That, that was a really key factor, was not reaching out to these developers and saying, your games aren't accessible, I'm blind, and this is an outrage. You know, that, that's, that's not how you win friends and influence people. But, you know, I, I reached out and said, hey, I'm blind, I love your games, and I would absolutely love if I could play them even more. And people seem to be receptive to, hey, this guy would give me more of his money if my games were playable. And, and people love that, so, and I think they genuinely want to make the market more accessible for everyone to get involved in things. And so that was how I really opened these channels of communication, um, was just not being afraid to reach out and talk to people and let them know where things weren't, were working very well and where things could be improved, and doing so diplomatically and with all the enthusiasm of a genuine fan of fighting games. Thank you. Absolutely, does that answer your question? Wonderful, wonderful. Does anyone else have anything? That's a good question. So just to make sure I'm, I'm answering the right thing here, uh, what you're asking is with the, the sheer number of games that I'm playing, how do I avoid getting the sounds from one game mixed up with the sounds from another? Is that right? Yes. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, practice, honestly, is, is a big part of it, and just really learning to hone the, the, the memory of each sound in each game. Honestly, when, you, when I start learning a new game, that happens a lot. Um, right now I'm learning Dead or Alive 6, because that just came out in March, uh, March 1st. And it's a three-dimensional fighting game, a lot like Tekken or Soul Calibur. So one of the things I get mixed up on a lot is expecting either the sounds or the controls to be similar to those other two games, which they are vastly different from. So it does take some getting used to. I would say the first week or so for me is not just learning the sounds of that game, but unlearning the sounds of the other games while playing this one, while also not forgetting them for when I go back to the other game. So when I switch back, if I've been playing, let's say, Mortal Kombat for about a month or so online, and then I switch over to Soul Calibur, I do take a minute or two in training mode, well, like a minute, I mean like an hour or two, in training mode to re-remind myself this is what this sounds like in this game, because just like if you were playing a game and then you jumped into another very similar game with a different control scheme, it, it's essentially like that. You have to take a moment to re-remind yourself what do the controls actually do in this game when I push the X button versus when I play this other game and push the X button because they're going to be different in different games. And so it's just, a, it's just a moment of kind of taking some time to re-familiarize yourself and reacquaint with what you're used to. But luckily the muscle memory associated with fighting games of learning combos, learning uh, reactions, things like that, are, it, it, it is such that it really facilitates re-jumping back into a game. Because at first you may be a little shaky, but it is a lot like riding a bicycle. Maybe you're wobbly at first after you haven't done it for a little while, but once you get back into the swing of it, that muscle memory picks up pretty well. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Hey, Michael. Hello. So have you ever heard, uh, let me just set this up first, given how you have to learn how to play these games just by learning the ropes and, like you said, making it muscle memory, have you ever heard any suggestions that you might actually have an advantage because you can't see the stuff, you have to internalize everything? That is a fantastic question. Um, so do I have an advantage, or have anyone ever suggested, has anyone ever suggested that I have, possibly a degree of advantage because I have to just so vigorously memorize things. Yes, actually, absolutely. People have totally suggested that, and to a degree, I absolutely agree with them. While I may be limited because I can't see what's going on on the screen, the intensity with which I study the sounds does put me ahead of the pack when it comes to casual players, at least, at first, because they 
are relying purely on sight and reactions to things, and the mind can actually respond to audio reactions um, faster than it can to visual input. So hearing something is actually a much faster way to react to it than seeing it. There's, I, I forget the exact numeric value, but I believe it's like a 0.45% faster reaction by audio than by sound. So someone who learns the audio can absolutely outpace someone who learns the, the, the sight of things. And now that's not to say if I were to play like one of the top competitive players in the world, could I beat him? Probably not, they're really, really good. But I would not be as completely outclassed as you would think a blind player versus a sighted player is. And to attest to that, there was a match that the two of the biggest names in Street Fighter competitive gaming, uh, Daigo Omahara and Justin Wong, played a match against each other where both were totally blindfolded. And if you couldn't see that they were blindfolded, you would have no way of knowing that they weren't being able to see what was going on because these players, just like me, had learned the sounds of the game they played so that it did become muscle memory, so that it was a 45% faster reaction time. Because in a fighting game, a tenth of a second counts for everything. If you can't react to something within a tenth of a second, you have a very good chance of losing. So when you get a, a, a way to boost your reaction time even more, the real competitive players are absolutely going to take it. And so that is, that's exactly why I, I love sound and why I think, yeah, it absolutely does give, not just me, but anyone who takes the time to learn sound, I think it's a leg up that everyone should totally take. Thank does that answer your question? Yes. Fantastic. We got anybody else? Any other questions? Hey there, Michael. Hello. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm with a company from Canada called Accessible Media. We're really excited to have you here today. From your perspective, what's the value on uh, on a larger, almost global scale of South by Southwest, an internationally recognized tech innovation gaming conference, having a track like this dedicated to accessibility and on a more personal level to get invited to have a microphone? <laughs> that is, that's a big question right there. <laughs> um, so how does it feel, first off, to get invited to something like this and to get a chance to speak at it? And then what is the, the importance of such an event on a, on a global level? Wow, that's, that's a lot to unpack. Um, on a personal level, I'll say it's a huge honor. Um, the fact that I was asked to speak here is, it, it, it's not just a huge honor, it's very self-affirming, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, South by Southwest is a huge event. It's larger than life. Like everything in Austin, it's, it's crazy and wild and big and great. It's also finite, though. There's a finite number of time, there are time slots, a finite amount of time that people are able to come and listen to events and hear speakers express their opinions or their innovations and so on and so forth. The fact that I was awarded some of that time is very validating in so far as it does make me feel as though my opinion as a person, and as a disabled person, and as a disabled gamer, is valued enough that the finite time at this globally recognized event, some of that time was awarded to me. That's, you gotta understand how validating that feels. That's an incredible feeling. As far as the significance of the event itself, I mean, without meaning to over-dramatize, it feels like having a platform to speak to the world, because People come from all over to come to South by Southwest. At my, at my day job recently, I was talking to a customer. I was helping them fix uh, one of their computers because they were going to be flying down from well across the country for South by Southwest and they needed it working. They needed the computer working by that time. And the fact that I was in my day job helping someone from across the nation who was coming here that just really helped stick into my mind. There are people from not just across the nation, but across the world who come to South By for its hugely innovative, hugely influential talks and events and experiences. And this is an event where people make history with new ideas, new concepts, where things are brought to the forefront that need to be seen and where people come home carrying with them not just awesome swag, but also awesome experiences and insights and innovations that have been brought to their attention by the experiences here. So for me, the importance of an accessibility panel or event or anything like that, or speaking engagement, and how it relates to not just gaming, but to technology and to everything, to me that means we're giving 
people the seeds of accessibility and encouraging them to go plant those seeds all over the world in their various tech companies and other ventures. Does that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Appreciate all that you do. Uh, absolutely. Thank you very, very much. All right. Do we have anyone else? Yes. Yay. <laughs> Gotta love those questions. That's a fantastic question. So have I ever tried to play World of Warcraft or other games, maybe not necessarily like fighting games, but something more like an MMO RPG? And could it be made accessible and how to go about doing that? First of all, I just want to say that's an awesome question. I definitely want to like talk with you more about that at length um, in the future. If you want um, to get my one of my business cards from my fiance, I think we could definitely have some awesome conversations about that. Um, about gaming and accessibility and how to you know, get there as one blind gamer to another. Um, as far as World of Warcraft specifically, I have not played it solo because it does necessitate use of the mouse. It is you know, PC exclusive and it does necessitate the mouse, which I cannot use. So it isn't a game that I've been able to play on my own. I have played with sighted friends where they will act as my hands and eyes and I'll make the decisions for the characters and such. Um, which is a degree of playing, but I know, and I'm sure you feel the same way, that you want to be able to play on your own or be able to be your own hands when it comes to playing these games. Um, yeah, it, it's a thing. I, I totally get it. There are other MMOs that are a lot more accessible. Um, a lot of the Bioware games, like um, Knights of the Old Republic, Dragons, uh, what is it called? Um, Dragon Age, that's what it is. Dragon Age are very, very accessible because of certain control schemes that have been made for the games that are inadvertently accessible. They weren't even designed to be, but they actually are because you can actually use triggers like the L2 and R2 buttons on a controller to lock on to not just enemies, but anything interactable in the environment, which allows you to basically navigate around like a sighted person would by clicking on things, except you use an auto lock feature and it's very accessible. Um, I was able to complete all three of the Dragon Age games on my own without any sighted assistance. Um, same goes for the Fable games, especially Fable 2. Now, as far as how to get in touch with people, you would want to find a way to get in touch with Blizzard, uh, the developers of World of Warcraft. Uh, being 100% honest, given how far into its lifespan it is, I'm not sure what changes they would be willing to make at this point, but you never know. So I, I think it's worth asking. Even if I think World of Warcraft has been around for so long, it might be something that they're hesitant to change. I think it's something that if they knew people were interested in, I mean, Blizzard is a company. They want to make amazing products. They also want to make a profit. And I think if they know there are people who want to buy this game who can't, that if not maybe in this game, but in their next games, if they can include more accessibility features, I think they will. For example, I play um, Diablo, which is also made by Blizzard. And I'm able to play that with almost no sighted assistance because there are features like the uh, target locking features and certain navigational assistance that absolutely make it something that I can play and dominate at without needing someone sighted to walk me around the game. And there are actually ways to make it co-op playable that are insanely fun and super accessible that completely work. So Blizzard made that and they made it accessible without even meaning to. So I think if they knew that they could add those same kind of features into other future games, make them playable for blind people, and they'd have another market you know, all to themselves, I think they would be all over that personally. Does that answer your question? Yes. Awesome, awesome. All right, who else we got? Hey, Michael. Hello. 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 Um, I'm a software engineer in the music technology industry, and um, yeah, me and the few colleagues of mine were really interested in accessibility in the music technology industry. And uh, you described today that how a yeah, an awesome ear for sound design. I was wondering if you've actually dabbled with any of these tools yourself, actually, as well, or thought about it. That's a great question. As far as my uh, my ear for sound design, has that led me to playing around with you know any software tools in the in the music technology world? 
It absolutely has. Um, in addition to being a gamer, I'm also a musician myself. I play a handful of different instruments, um, guitar, piano, accordion, harmonica, and I took several years of operatic vocal training so that I could do heavy metal vocals without hurting my throat, um, which is really fun. But um, all that said, I've done a lot of recording of my music and such, and working with other people in recording music um, and my own, you know, my own uh, instruments and things like that. So I have worked with a lot of different tools um, for accessibility uh, or for like music recording and have different experiences with them in terms of accessibility. Um, there's a really simple tool that I use a lot just for simple uh, kind of home recordings of music. Um, it's an, actually just an iPhone app uh, called Loopy, and it's a little looping app that records a single audio track and then replays it over and over, creating an audio loop, and allows me to record up to 16 simultaneous loops, one over the other, over the other, building it into a track and then pan them, you know, left and right, increase their levels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and create a song out of just tapping on little audio loops on my iPhone. And apps like that are surprisingly accessible. Um, I've had some issue with a few other apps um, not being quite as accessible or quite as blind friendly. Um, things like uh, GarageBand, they kind of work, but not as fluidly as I'd like. And sometimes the problem is that screen readers, while doing their best to read out loud what's on the screen, will end up talking over your audio recordings, which is not so good. But um, I think there's a lot of potential in the music world, in the music technology world, for making recording software or perfecting it to be more accessible for blind people and for people with other disabilities. And I definitely know a large enough amount of blind musicians that it would definitely be a worthwhile endeavor for sure. Does that answer your question? Awesome, awesome. <laughs> I was wondering when someone was going to ask. That's a great question. Um, so for my day job, I work at a large technology company. Um, they're a little bit intense on privacy, so I'm not actually supposed to say where I work. But suffice it to say, I work at a large technology company that is well known for making smartphones and computers and things. And um, very good at accessibility, and I do tech support for this company um, that is one of their many offices is here in Austin. Um, I do tech support for this company over the phone, so I'm the sort of person you call when your phone isn't working the way it should be, or your computer, uh, I also do uh, handle stuff with their line of computers, and so I'm the person you call when the phone or computer or tablet or TV accessory that shall remain nameless is not working the way you would expect it to be working, and then we talk and talk and try things until it starts working the way it should be again. And it's a rigorous job, and it's an intense one, and convincing people that I absolutely can help them even though I'm blind, which usually doesn't come up on calls, but there are very rare times it does when they want to describe something on the screen and I have no idea what it actually looks like. Um, then explaining to them that I'm blind and then regaining their trust. Yeah, that takes some work, but um, I'm doing pretty well at it so far, so I, I enjoy it a lot. Before that job, I was an English teacher, or an English tutor, rather, at Austin Community College. And then before that, I was uh, working on getting a book written and self-publishing that, and that was kind of my main focus at that time. Um, so yeah, that's what I do now. How big is the blind gaming community? Fantastic question. Numerically speaking, I don't know. I wish I did, but I don't. But as far as how big it is, just relative to the sighted gaming community, not as big, obviously. There are less blind people than there are sighted people. However, I know per, uh, I, I guess to scale, I know more blind people enthusiastic about gaming than I do sighted people or if not more, just as many. Um, of all of the blind people I know, very few of them are not at least a little bit into some degree of gaming. Um, because gaming is great for blind people when there's uh, a lot of limitations on maybe our transportation or on other things that we might be able to readily do on our own, which I think we totally can do, we just need accommodations for them. 
gaming is something that there's a lot of potential for us to do on our own. And because growing up blind people are taught, hey, the games that you can play because you're blind are card games. You can play Uno and Go Fish. And I think myself and almost every other blind people are absolutely sick to death of playing Go Fish. And the fact that whenever a new game developer comes out with an app on the App Store for the blind, they say, this is a gaming app for the blind. Perfectly replicates card games like Go Fish with realistic card sounds. Like, hard pass, I'm gonna go play Mortal Kombat. You know, so that's, I, I think the when the blind community numerically is huge, I can't say, but I can definitely say that they make up in equal measure as far as to scale. I think there are as many blind gamers within the blind community as there are to scale sighted gamers within the sighted community, and I think they probably are just as, if not more, eager to get their hands on and stay loyal to games than uh, their sighted counterparts. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. person is doing that. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, so as far as what would I like game reviews to touch on to make sure that they're accessible or to really bring to uh, blind people and disabled people in general what, um, you know, kind of a, a detailed idea of will they be able to play this game? That's a fantastic question because there are so many times where I have bought games or gotten excited about games only to learn that they wouldn't be playable for me, um, or at least not without a lot of sighted assistance. Um, there are some big factors in that with a lot of different games. Um, one of the biggest ones is spoken dialogue. That's almost a given in most games nowadays, but there are some lower budget, like kind of indie games, that it's not as much of a given, where you'll go up to a character and then instead of actually having voice dialogue, they'll just print the text on the screen. And I think you can do both. You can print the text and have the spoken dialogue. I think that's best for everyone so that people can read it and hear it. But when a game sounds amazing and I really want to play it, then I buy it only to learn that none of the characters actually make any audible noise when they talk and I can't tell anything that's going on. That's $60 down the drain and I get a little bit frustrated. So I think that's one big thing is, is there spoken dialogue? Will I be able to hear all of the, the narration or, or text or spoken things that other people would get by reading? Um, Another big factor for blind people specifically would be how much of an emphasis on movement and precise navigation is there both within the game world and within menus. Especially with RPG style games like World of Warcraft where you have to click on different menu bars and drag items into different menus and things like that. How much of that is doable for a blind person um, and how much does the game rely on these menus to be precisely navigated in order for you to be successful? Uh, same with the game environment. Is the world very, very treacherous? And if you take one wrong step, will you plummet to your death? Like in Dark Souls, for instance. Um, you know, is this the kind of game where you will be vigorously punished for exploring if you can't see where you're going? Those sorts of things are absolutely crucial to blind players. Um, and then for players who are hard of hearing, um, are there any things like positional audio that will help them? For example, um, kind of like subtitles, but captions for audio, is there something that will tell them, hey, there's someone shooting at you right now, and there are, you know, shoot, bullets are incoming from the left, or something like that, or there's a creepy crawly sound from this horror game monster, you know, up and left from where you are, or right from where you are. Is there anything that allows them to visually get that same kind of feedback? Um, I think those sorts of features are really, really essential. Um, and rather than rattle off a list of features, I, I'll offer a piece of advice. When you're reviewing a game, try, if, if not for long, even for a couple of minutes, try playing it without whichever sense you're thinking about. Blindfold yourself and play a fighting game. Plug your ears and play a first person shooter, etc., etc., and see what difficulties you run into or what areas the game actually makes this possible to do without that sense, and highlight those in your review. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Hello.
That's a good question. So with all the technology available to me, what technology would I like to have more available or what, what could be improved upon in upcoming years? The biggest one is going to, of course, be anything related to transportation. Transportation-based technology, anything that allows me to navigate more independently is going to be where I, where I want things to improve. Because right now, I can do things around my house no problem. My fiance put braille labels on our microwave so I can heat up the kind of horrible frozen food I like. Um, you know, I have uh, an Apple TV with voiceover so I can read what's on the screen. So I'm good watching TV and eating frozen snacks and playing video games. But if I want to go to the store to get more frozen snacks or get more video games, possibly at the same time, I have to call a sighted friend for transportation or pay a Lyft driver to take me somewhere or, goodness forbid, book a metro access ride through the city of Austin, which means I have to book it 24 hours in advance, have to have a multiple hour pickup window in which they can be late and not be penalized, but if I miss their ride by two minutes, then they don't have to pick me up again for like a month. Um, you know, so things like that, not so much fun. Transportation, if, if, if technology can make transportation more viable for the blind, I think that is, that's the area I would like to see improved upon the most for, for blind people, is technology that allows more independent navigation, movement, transportation in cities and any other area. Cool, <laughs> yeah, there you go. She, she, you know what I'm talking about. Hello. Hello. Oh, more accessible? No, but more awesome? Yes. <laughs> as far as, uh, that is a good question though. As far as gaming, are there brands that I like because they're more accessible? Honestly, yes and no. Uh, when it comes to controllers, not really. Um, I don't use standard controllers like the, uh, I, use, I play mostly on the PlayStation. I don't use the PlayStation's DualShock controller very much at all. Um, but that's mostly because I play fighting games, so what I use are what are called fight sticks, which are basically large arcade stick style controllers with like the joystick you control with your whole left hand and then like the large round button layout for the right hand. Um, I use those for fighting games partially because they're awesome, but also because um, they just allow a lot more flexibility and comfort for me and like a lot less in the way of, you know, carpal tunnel-y, crampy kind of controls. Um, also, you can mod them to make them look really cool, and even if I can't see them, I love putting custom artwork and colors on those things because, you know, you can show it off to other people. Um, I do know there are brands of custom controllers, though, especially I know Microsoft has been really leading the pack with that for their Xbox, with very customizable controllers for people with mobility-related issues. Um, so controllers that you can remap buttons to or redesign in ways that are more friendly to your own unique movement limitations um, and your own unique like accommodative needs. Um, as far as other products though, I am very picky about headsets and speakers and they aren't really designed with accessibility in, accessibility in mind, but you know, I do kind of demand a good degree of performance from my headsets and speakers because I need them to have good positional audio, good, you know, multiple speakers that give me a very clear three-dimensional picture of where things are based on their audio. So that's less about accessibility, like some of those modifiable controllers, and just more about how good the stereos are. But again, I think that's one of those things that may be accidentally designed with accessibility in mind. It's kind of universal design because if a speaker is good, or a set of speakers are good, then a blind person can use them and benefit from them in their own way. So is it a precise brand? No, but I definitely think there are precise needs that can be met by various pieces of equipment. I really like Logitech. Um, in terms of speakers, I do like Logitech speakers. Um, I do like, um, right now for recording for sound, just for like live streams and such, I use the uh, Yeti microphone. Um, I think it's by a company called Blue. Um, I use, uh, for controllers, for the fight sticks, I use the Razer uh, Panthera and the Quamba Dragon controllers. Um, and then as far as like those other modifiable controllers, I'm not sure the brand, I believe Microsoft act actually makes those modifiable Xbox controllers. Um, and then in, in terms of just headsets themselves, I've tried a bunch of different ones. I've tried, I actually do really like the Beats headsets. Um, Bose makes decent ones, but I think they're a little bit highly marked up for the sound quality. Um, 
there are a lot of different really good ones out there. Sennheiser makes phenomenal gaming headsets. I've had a lot of good luck with Sennheiser. Um, so yeah, I think those, that's a really, really solid headset for someone who demands a lot out of their audio is uh, probably any of the higher end Sennheiser headphones. You're very welcome. Okay, everyone, we have time for only one more question. One more question. Five or how many fingers am I holding up? This many. <laughs> 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 I didn't see that coming. Yeah. Get it blind trip. Ha, ha, ha.